Right. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. So, um, well, welcome everyone to, I don't even know what number this is. What number is it? Seven. seven. Thanks, Dan. Uh, number seven in the uh, series that's not a series on, uh, on conversations around co-production. Um, I'm Rob Copeland, Director of the Advanced Wellbeing Research Centre. have got um, the usual crew, Dan, Liz and Joe uh, with us, but we are um, absolutely delighted to uh, welcome Lynn Laidlaw uh, to our, our, our merry band of, um, of, of discussies, if that's even a, a word. Um, uh, I, I'm probably a bit overexcited because I'm actually, as you can see, in the, in, back in the AWRC today. So um, it's all gone to my head and um, yeah, I, I'm feeling very, uh, very excited about that. Um, Lynn, um, it's w wonderful to have you. Would you um, uh, mind introducing yourself and, um, and just kind of telling us who you are and where you're from? So I'm from, I stay in central Scotland and I describe myself as an involved patient um, public contributor. Um, and for the past four years, I've become very, very involved in mainly patient and public, quite more traditional patient and public involvement in research, but in lockdown have, um, have been doing some stuff with the, the UCL Centre for Co-Production in health research. Um, I'm really enjoying co-producing with them and I wrote a blog for them recently um, talking about my, my emotional journey. I had a four-year diagnostic odyssey and then which then led into my involvement odyssey and just about how all that what how it was a very emotional journey and some thoughts about emotional labor and just what i suppose why people get get involved and people get involved and they want to co-produce and whatever because the emotions drive that mm -hmm. because they've had experiences or they feel that they've got, they've got something to give and, and that that actually can be quite, quite damaging in a way because sometimes people involve you for, in ways that, that are maybe not the right reason or you don't have power over the terms of your involvement and whatever, but it matters so much to you. It's very, very difficult to walk to walk away so how do you how do you manage that um so it was just a lot a lot of issues around that um yeah and so i connected with with joe on, on on twitter about some of these issues and i suppose for me i'm excited about exploring co-production you know kind of feeling that, that i know about involvement and that i'm embedded in these traditional kind of nihr type involvement stuff where I'm co-applicant in grants and I'm doing lay review and I'm sitting in funding subcommittees and whatever. But co-production looks like this great big shiny new world that I'm just, you know, so excited about, about, about exploring. Um, and I think that I suspect that a lot of the issues are, are, are going to, and a lot of the thoughts and a lot of the feelings are, are going to be, are going to be similar. Okay. So. What? I mean, do you want to, I mean, it seems like um, a really kind of nice place to start if you kind of tell us a bit more about your um, kind of your blog and where that's come from, what's driven that, you know, the sort of the, the experience and um, uh, through, through your involvement. Perhaps if we, if we start there, if you wouldn't mind, tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, so the, the blog has been about, so I would say that it's been in my head for about three years, but and this speaks to how emotional it all is. And then I got to a stage where I, I just had to get it down in paper and I just sat down and it just all came out. Mm. Um, and due to a few experiences um, recently, um, because it was a lot to unpack because I had a four year diagnostic odyssey um, because I've quite, a, I've quite a rare disease and it, you know, which took me so it took me all over, my diagnostic odyssey took me all over the UK. Um, I had about over 10 second opinions all over the UK and I 
was emailing clinicians, emailing researchers, reading all the research I could get my hands on. And a lot of the research was behind paywalls. It was written in language that, that I didn't understand. And that, that, that was a real challenge. And about the emotions, about that, because I was told that my symptoms were, were psychosomatic and, and whatever. So then I eventually got, got my diagnosis and, and I thought, right, okay. So I, and it just made me realize that, that research is really practical. I'd never, I'd been a nurse and I kind of, well, I, yeah, I use research and, and, and my, my work, but all of a sudden research really mattered because it was about the care that I could access and it was about my diagnostic process and, and, and whatever. And, and I thought, well, you know, I have perspectives and I have insight that, that, that that's, that's useful here. So it made sense to me that the involving people with that just just made sense you know are are we are we choosing the right outcomes or that are, are, are the methods good does this have meaning for people and then i tried to start getting involved you know and i was reading about researchers oh we can't find anyone to involve and whatever and i'm like here jumping up and down saying involve me and involve me and again emailing writing you know saying to people i really want to get involved in this and finding doors shut in my face not getting anywhere until i got just a lot of work a lot of work and effort until i got to a stage where i was involved in in, in quite in quite a bit of stuff and it just struck me that those odysseys had been very very similar and why did they need to be that way why did it take four years for me to get my diagnosis why did it take four years, you know, a good number of years for me to get really involved. And I suppose the last thing, last point that, that I kind of want to make, and I, I really made it in my blog, was that when you look at published research, we, we look at the positive all the time, don't we? Because not all research is, is published, not all research is, is, is registered. And what can we learn from things that, that haven't gone so well. And if you read, I, su I suspect if you read a lot of the literature around challenging situations and involvement and co-production, a lot of it will focus on individual behaviors that, you know, people were too challenging or they came with the agenda because public contributors are the only people that have an agenda, don't you know? And, you know, people get emotional and, and, and whatever. And we don't look at the, at the absolute and total essential things around power and frameworks and control and and whatever and why we why we create these why we create the, these the, these situations and then I pondered on you know debating these and I, I debate these kind of things endlessly on on, on Twitter and, and with friends and how that debate is sometimes really difficult especially on social media when we can work out what tone is, nuance is lacking and whatever, and just let's have an honest debate that actually, you know what, we can do harm to people and harm has been done to people. And the involvement of co-production of web, it's not a method, it's not a framework, it's, it's a feeling, it, it, it matters. And if people are getting involved because of these things, then we've got a duty of care, we've got a moral obligation not to just do it because we need to tick a box to get a grant or or, or whatever and let's just be really honest and, and and have an honest conversation and work together to overcome these and and, and, and yeah and, and and that just and like i say it just all you know kind of okay. <laughs> vomited out and and the wonderful thing is because the ucl center facilitated that and then the responses that I've had you know like people sending me messages and responses on you know and just people saying thank you thanks for putting that out there you know thanks for starting this 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 conversation and that and, and I didn't want I didn't want it to be about me and you know this wasn't about Lynn's story this was about using what had happened to me to make points that to illustrate points that, that I felt needed to be needed to be made yeah yeah and, and you 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 um one well, last question for me and I'll, I'll i'll get out of the way um you talk in your blog about um this idea around 
you know, ensuring that everyone's voice is not only heard, but kind of listened to. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that's a really interesting distinction. What, what do you, what do you kind of mean by that? Is that about the, 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 the sort of the power side of things? Is that, what, is that what you're driving out there? Yeah, I, I think so. So I, I, I've had some situations where, so I think that the ownership is really, is really important. So if I'm, and, and again, I'm, I'm coming more from a kind of sort of traditional patient and public involvement thing. So if I'm, if I'm on a PPI group and we have, who decided, who decides what goes in the PPI section of an application form? You know, who, who, owns, who owns that section? Um, because I, I do a lot of lay review of, um, of, of, of grants and a lot of PPI sections are, are cut and paste. You know, it's like, yeah, we had this idea, we convened a group of patients, we told them about the idea, they said it was absolutely fantastic, we had a cup of tea and a bit of cake and we all went home. Whee! You know, but, but I want, okay, so what, what were the challenges? So one, if there was no challenges, then have you done it properly? Were people given permission to be, to be critical friends? Did you really hear what they said? You said you've listened, but did you really hear what they said? What changed as a result? Of that process you know did you talk about things like what your primary outcome was whether that was meaningful whether the methods you know I, I saw um, some research recently where the primary outcome for a cardiology trial was an extra 30 seconds on a treadmill exercise tolerance and I'm like yeah so I'm to go on this trial take this medication with that may have all these side effects and the primary outcome is oh I can get an extra 30 seconds on the treadmill. In what, in what way is that, is, that, is, that, is that meaningful? So I think that's kind of where I was coming from. You know, yes, we hear you, but, you know, or, or we're listening to you, but actually what are you going to do as a result of that? And give me evidence. This is research. I want evidence. So I want evidence of a robust process. And, and that includes the challenges. That includes things that don't go so well. What can we learn from stuff that, go, that doesn't go so well? Let's not sweep it under the carpet. Let's reflect, let's critically reflect and, and, use, and use that. Damn. Crikey. No, well, it's all right. I was, there is so much to go on. <laughs> you've, you've kind of encapsulated almost the last kind of uh, six uh, of our conversations yeah. uh, and I, it's, 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 it's like a kind of smorgasbord of, of interesting things to start on. I don't know where to kind of uh, go first. And I'm, I'm going to go just because you, you spoke about it so eloquently just now around this whole issue of how currently within funding structures this idea of patient and public involvement sits before researchers get given any money to do research and then how that represents power structurally in its first instance that that actually devalues that process by not funding people to do it and then it comes to your point that in order to hear people we've got to create the conditions for them to speak but we also then have to respect the fact that we've also got to create the conditions what's been spoken to be heard by people who are in a position to do anything about that when they've got no money before they go and do a project. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's a question in there or I'm just going slightly. Uh, good, good. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's, that's just, it's a real issue, it, it, isn't there? I, I think that, and I think that it, it gets in the way of people that, that really want to do good involvement and, and, and want to co-produce things, you know, that, that, that want to, because very little sort of traditional research is, is kind of co-produced because that, that, that's, going to, that's going to take time, isn't it? Because you need to get together and you need to have these ideas, you need to bounce them off, off each other and whatever. And who's going to pay for that time? Who's going to pay for the academic time? Who's going to pay for my, for my time? And, and it's almost like we, we have this ask, don't we? A lot of funders, we won't fund you unless you do PPI, but actually 
but actually we're not we're not going to create the conditions for you to do meaningful PPI. So actually all you've got left to do is do box ticking. Yeah. Um, PPI and I am very very guilty of I think seeing things from my own perspective. Joe and I talked about this about the, the other day that that we get into silos because I am so used to fighting my corner. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so used to banging the PPI drum and whatever that it can be very difficult for me to come out to climb out of my silo and realize that actually researchers it, it, it it's not just me it's the whole system when, when you have to invest so much into having your voice heard it makes it difficult for you to then open up to hear other voices as well um because it's all about the kind of transmission of your message it's, it's got to so much has got to be invested into the resources to get that message across that there's far less kind of there to receive stuff um, and it almost sets up this adversarial kind of thing around this is my perspective this is my perspective you're not listening you're not listening and the, the, the on at the same time there's there's people on the other end you know giving a tokenistic nod to saying yes we're we're hearing you we're hearing you we're hearing you but it's not manifest in anything then that kind of practical or practice space in, in in terms of text on a page or any kind of substantial changes to say that they are actually receiving that message and it must be you know it's the never-ending frustrations throughout social history of these social movements to create change whether it was um women's right to vote or you know slavery or whatever it was it's people saying this is wrong but not having the power to and that that message constantly being lost um and i, I think there's there's something i mean where you started off with the emotional investment on this um it, there's there's something that resonates for me all the way back to the stuff we've been talking about through all of the other conversations we've had and i think brett summarized it really nicely where he talked about it as being co-production being um a way of being rather than a way of doing and i think because participants people who are patient representatives they come with that emotional investment they come with that they have some they want to be there for a reason for a reason relevant to their own health care and also the wider care of people who have similar challenges to them similar health problems but there isn't because it's been reduced to this process to doing a thing you do as a researcher and you tick boxes a thing you have to do it doesn't come with the same emotional investment. And so there's this kind of emotional dissonance or whatever it is. It's, it's kind of people are at completely different levels of how they're invested and what they're investing into this and what they're getting out of it. Um, and I think there's... I'm afraid, I'm afraid I've got to go. I've been kicked out of the bill, despite my kind of really exciting bit to be building. It shuts at four and security's <laughs> just come in. They're going to kick me out of my own building. So I'm having a nightmare. So I'm so sorry, but I'm literally I'm I, the guy. I can't <laughs> the guy for another because he's already off an hour late. Change onto your phone, Rob. Uh, you could talk. You could, yeah, uh, might, do I'll, I'll, that, I'll be outside. So I'll, on I'll, your bike. I'll come out. Of the <laughs> again, so I'm so sorry about this. Useless. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> See you in a bit. We can adapt. <laughs> Power of the system. <laughs> yeah. The man's got him. He's director of his own research centre, and he kicks kicked out of his own building. <laughs> Yeah, um, and I think there's emotional costs for um, f there's undoubtedly emotional costs for researchers as well. They, they, they may they may be different, and I think it must be what you're talking about, Dan. Just you know, really wanting to do something, but if you can, and wanting to do it properly and wanting to do it well, but if you can access the resources to do that, then. Well, but also, and being told that you must do this, <laughs> that must do coming with no resource. Um, yeah, yeah, and and actually. It is interesting. So I'm aware of little pockets of money around to support kind of this, so, but they're kind of five hundred pounds. So you can run a tea and toast and yeah. put some people in a focus group, and and you just kind of go. I mean, it's uh, it does. I think that dissonance point that Joe was making is really is really interesting, isn't it? So you've got researchers nervous about putting their life work in front of people who've got this emotional investment. In, in it and they are ill prepared and worried that they're not doing the right thing because there isn't a systematic way of training people how to do this properly because it's not resourced so why would you develop 
And then you've got people coming in really wanting, uh, as you've described yourself, uh, having a real emotional investment in this and wanting to share that and wanting to see that that's heard. And it is, it's setting up this kind of, these people are coming in in different emotional states into this kind of hastily constructed uh, uh, situation. So, yeah, I, I, I just, no, it is, it's really interesting. Um, see, I've got little experience when it comes to PPI, but I kind of think that it's similar in terms of sort of actual practice as well and the barriers that people face. And I think this kind of issue around the respect and the investment just keeps on coming up with these conversations, doesn't it, time and time again. Um, and I, you know, I remember Chrissy, um, Chrissy Bonham, she was talking in, uh, I can't remember when, a couple of uh, podcasts back. And, uh, and she, I remember her talking very much about feeling valued um, within a kind of co-production setting. And she didn't like the term co-production and, um, and reflected on quite a few uh, sessions where she had felt that as somebody with lived experience, she was, um, her views weren't, were all, it was all a bit to tokenistic. And I think that's, that's, I've heard that so much. And I've seen that so much, you know, in practice. I'm sure that's similar with the sort of PPI sort of research world as well. But Chrissy very much talked about uh, feeling. And I think you mentioned um, that, I think you said something around co-production. Um, it's not necessarily a framework. It's not necessarily a thing. And it's about how people feel and how people, you know, and do people feel respected. And actually, um, you know, that's something that if you've got kind of good values and, um, um, and are very respectful of people, that's something that we kind of know, you know, naturally. However, I'm catching myself, think, catching myself mid-talking mid because maybe I consider myself somebody that has good values and, uh, and is respectful of other people. But at the same time, I'm still a professional that's been caught up in a system whereby you try and do well, you try and involve people, you try and do good co-production type of work, but you can't help but fall into the trap sometimes. So I think I, I can reflect on previous experiences where I've tried to work in partnership with people and ended up disrespecting them, you know, because of the constraints of the service. And, um, and you know, I've, I've, I've learned my lessons and don't want to go down that route again, but I think that that is the problem of people not investing well in sort of this type of this type of work, whether that's PPI or kind of more of a practical approach. Um, but another point, sorry, I'm going to shut up in a minute. But another point, when you were talking, you made me think um, in terms of like um, people being experts in their own condition and um, and your blog and your kind of personal experience of having your diagnosis and and wanting that having that desire to sort of share and help out and I again I've heard that from other people as well and and I remember one particular story I don't know who it was or when but I remember this lady had a child um, who had a condition and she became absolutely expert with it about this condition and um, and you know it's not surprising, is it? As a mum, you would do your research if your child has has something. So, but she said, like whatever GP I go to, they just do not accept that I know more about my child's condition than they do. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that is again that conflict with power. And I just think that is so interesting. And I hope we're changing in terms of power and um, and that kind of medical kind of health professional expert sort of um, status that health professionals can have but it's still conflicting isn't it with with how we operate as a society and um, and I think you know some through this kind of co-production through this sort of chat and through your twitter kind of blogs or whatever I'm hoping that we're all changing that a little bit I'm gonna shut up now yeah, no, it's it's really. So I used to I used to be a nurse, and my I was forced to kill health retirement, and the way my thinking has gone three hundred and sixty degrees, just the difference. So, if a patient had 
told me my my diagnostic or to say my diagnostic journey, I wouldn't have believed them because I wouldn't have believed the health service because that wasn't the service that I worked in or that wasn't my perception of the service that I worked in. But actually experiencing that was was was, was totally was totally different. And it, it's just and I get that a lot because I'm very knowledgeable about, about my diseases. And you know if I go into hospital then you know I, I know more than, than anyone else. But but and we, we we're all searching for, we just all love control, didn't we? I love control as a nurse. I absolutely love control as a nurse. And I love it as a patient. You know, and it's, if I go into hospital, I don't want to give up my medication. I don't want to give control. You know, because I manage my diseases very well. And I'm giving you, you know, my medication. And I know that you don't know what it's for. <laughs> you know, I know that I know much more about it than, 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 than you do. And, and it's the same as, you know, when you come to things like, what matters and, and, and sort of primary outcomes and and then how we how, how we measure stuff you know how do we do we do we measure stuff that's measurable or do we measure stuff that's really meaningful to people and i think we measure stuff that that's measurable you know we research has moved on and we have all this wonderful science and whatever but when it comes to problems like patient reported outcome measures we just, it's like going into Tesco's, what do I need from a team, grabbing something off the shelf? Oh, here, you know, I'll have the SF36 or the EQ5D and that will do. And just not putting any thought into, actually, does a predetermined questionnaire like that with no free text boxes ever meaningfully capture my experience as a patient? I so yes, don't get started on that one. I mean, um, the the SF uh, thirty six we used in the spinal injury unit. Oh uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I remember this. And we got we got told that we weren't obviously because of course it's sacrosanct, um, uh, so you can't change anything. But one of the questions is about mobility, and you want to go. That's not an opening gambit to build trust with people <laughs> in the spinal injuries unit to ask them about how how they're able to walk. It's, uh, it's, it's never going to be a great response to that one. And I think the, the measurement thing is, is key. And I think some of the newer patient reported outcome measures that are specific and co-produced, I think there's some good examples from previous Clark work around mental health. Some of those, I think, do get closer to what's important, actually important to people. And um, yeah, so I... I but with such a culture around the use of validated tools yep. um, as a way of uh, reducing the need to argue or justify or fight for something new. In a sense, the whole thing is stifling innovation. It's stifling the possibility of creating. So methodologically, it's, it's very constrained, very limited, only to those methods that have some validated. And it, unless you can have some form of validation within a very short time frame new methods just get kind of squashed and suppressed and um i, I think it's it's a very dangerous culture because that in itself begins to uh, limit and constrain research and innovation in in very invisible kind of ways which are um actually subversive and, and not very healthy or helpful for the research ecosystem i think um yeah, absolutely. I mean, I say, you know, validated from whose perspective? You know, they don't, I, you know, I, when I've been in clinical trials and whatever, I just want to chuck them through the window. <laughs> you know, and, and, and I, said, I said one back, you know, some of the cardiology ones are from the 1970s. What stayed still in cardiology since the 1970s? So I sent it back with a note saying, this does not validate my experience, you know, and then got a letter in reply. But, but you, are, you are so right. And, and I think that this, this fits into co-production and it, it fits in you know especially in, in services and things like that because there is because there is so much we can't change because when you question these things you're told they're validated and you know so I mean things like and, and I, I hear what you're saying Dan about about some of the new co-produced problems and whatever but did anyone ever ask the fundamental question did anyone ever sit a group of patients around and down and say, do you think a prom is ever the best way to measure your experience, even if it is co-produced? And, and that because, so we, we don't go to the, and it's the same as co-production. 
who gets to decide what is going to be co-produced? So could I get together with someone else that has the same disease that I have or another rheumatological disease and say, go to my local hospital and say, let's co-produce this service? Or would I need to wait for an invite to be involved in co-production? And that's where the real power lies, isn't it? Oh, well, who yeah, can the, initiate that process? The funding. Uh, we, um, if we haven't discussed it here, we've discussed it in other places. But yes, this is uh, this is at the, the heart of of the challenge, especially in the research world, uh, is that um, research costs lots of money. Money has is not uh, agnostic; it has its own agenda. As everybody in the in the thing does, and and we know from things like the James Lind Alliance, when you look at what patients are interested in terms of research, it's around self management and self care, and you look at what's funded, and it's drug charts because the money follows something that you can package up, patent, and then sell on and make a profit. Uh, so there is this these things that skew power at, at all these in all these different kind of directions. Um, I did briefly want to go back because uh, I'm a nurse uh, as well and I was just interested in your kind of what you would say now to your nurse perhaps your newly qualified self as a nurse when confronted with a with a, a very knowledgeable patient um, because I kind of feel like we were warned that oh crikey no mustn't take quickly take those drugs, they'll be taking their own tablets before you know it. Um, <laughs> let's lock them in a cupboard, because uh, who knows what chaos would ensue if they're able to do their own thing. Uh, I wonder what you'd, how you'd, how you'd kind of approach yourself now <laughs> with what you know. I, I, so it's, it's all with the benefit of hindsight, isn't it? I, yeah, I, I think that there's something about it's so funny, like because I, I use I use Twitter a lot, and I follow quite a lot of nurses and, and whatever on Twitter. And see when I see conversation about my patients, and I used to say that all the time, my patients. You know, and now I just want to say they're not yours. <laughs> you know, they don't they don't belong to you. And it, it's I, I think it's I think it's just things like like that. You know, and there was someone had posed the question the other day. You know, how, how many times? You know, would we, we, we you try to get blood with someone, you know, before giving up? Yeah, well, talk to your patient about it. How many times, you know, would they want you to? And I, I think it's it's just more about, and I used to, I mean, I never said this, but I used to work with a lot of people because I worked in intensive care where people would say, oh, but we're the expert. You, and I think there's there's levels and degrees of, of, of expert and you so th and things like you know I used to write settles and slept well in people's notes and not ask people how or if they say well I didn't sleep very well and I'm like well of course you did you know because I was a night shift and I looked and you seem to sleep fine to me and it's it I suppose I've realized more now that so many things are subjective you know I was when I was wrote in people's notes and whose notes are they anyway I was writing about my people, patients would tell me things and what I wrote was my interpretation of what they told me. Whereas much more now, I, I, I would say, you know, and if we're on a ward round and then we're, we're huddled over there and then we come to the bed, well, why didn't we just come to the bed from the start and involve? And then, and I, yeah, so I, I think that I would, would, have, would have thought, yeah, well, I like to think that, yeah. And, and it's just, and I think it's, it's all about control again. It's all about giving up some control and some power so that others, that others can take it. Um, I've, I've got to just follow in. Do you want to add anything to that, Dan, or am I jumping no, in too soon? No, 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 on your goal is, yeah. I suppose I've got a bit of a question for you as well, Lynn. I hope you don't mind, but... Um, just thinking about kind of um, your experience and um, what do you think or what would you want to see over the next 10 years and what do you think is possible in terms of the way that the health, healthcare is 
because there's a, there's a there's some kind of energy for this isn't there there's some kind of um you know there's there's more kind of documents policies or whatever which talk a lot more about co-design and listening to people and the the um what's that slogan it's not about me what's that slogan? nothing about me without me yeah yeah and um what is possible do you or what do you want to see in the next 10 years in terms of change changing towards adopting this kind of approach i suppose i i don't think that anything will change unless attitudes change so i was um i was speaking to um sally crow who who works who works in involvement um and, and she was saying to me that that, that when she starts something and, and she does stuff in services and whatever what, what she says to people is don't involve patients if you're not willing to listen to what they say and if you're not willing to change as a result of, of what they're going to say and if you're not willing to do that just don't involvement and, and I think that there is a I think there is a moral thing here and there is a virtue signaling around a lot of co-production and whatever, and we do it because, you know, I am fed up reading about co-production. I, you know, I wouldn't have said that, so I, I have been told that I have been part of a co-produced thing. P people are telling me that, and I know, I know that it hasn't, that it hasn't been. So I suppose I just want it to be, the word authentic springs to mind and, 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 and realistic and do it because, because you want to do it, because you really believe in it. And if you don't, well, then get the hell out of it and leave it to someone that does because the damage that can be done to people like me who come wearing our hearts and our sleeves just with this, it, it, you know, it just, it, it just matters, you know, the word just ma matters just keeps on coming into my head. It just matters so much and to be to feel that you know you are bringing this and you you're bringing your emotional investment and you really want to improve things so don't do it unless you really believe in it and let's change let's change attitudes and let's you know and, and to me i i don't think we can do meaningful co-production and i don't think we can make it worse work until until that changes and once we have that then the other things will fall into place but at the moment we're we're worrying about about frameworks and models and and all the rest of it but if we don't have the real desire to do that and the willingness to equalize power and whatever then then nothing's going to change i, I think that it they, it's that listening and being open and prepared to change is the kind of important bit, which again goes back to how Brett described it as a way of being rather than a, a way of doing. So it's not a procedural thing. It's not a series of activities or steps unless they are activities and steps within an overarching mindset, attitude, way of being, uh, way of relating to other people. Um, all people, whether it's other researchers, other service providers, health professionals or patients, it's listening and being able to change your perspective or your perception about things based on what they say um, and change. So, Go on. Yeah, no, I, so I, I, I agree. Uh, but at what level do these attitudes need to change? This is the key thing, because we can change attitudes at a kind of a service level. So you could have a service... Uh, uh, that um, so I reflect on kind of uh, Liz's work around mental health and sexual health and social care. You kind of adopted wherever possible a co-productive approach to developing services involving people and decisions about their care. I know this person sent me a couple of people, but but that was there. But unless that was enabled by somebody with the purse strings. Uh, then you kind of so it's it's so do we have to wait for a generation of people to to ascend to those lofty levels to be able to kind of change that and it, you i mean you for me a massive massive change has got to be within funding joe and i have talked about this so many times around that involvement process whatever you call it 
should be part of the proposal you put together. That grant should start from that part. Um, I know that the argument is, uh, and it comes back to you, um, we're going to explore something together. If that is not important to people who have lived experience of that, why should we be doing it? But I think there are some checks and measures there, but we should fund properly that initial engagement process that then allows that thread of, I think this is important. I think actually what we ought to do is uh, challenge the kind of received wisdom on what it is to gather and use people's experience in these things, work all the way through. But that's a, that's a massive change from what we're currently seeing. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I thought somebody was going to come in with a good comment then. It was your daughter. My, my daughter was going to come into the room with a loud comment. <laughs> <laughs> I want it. What to say, and I don't expect the answer. Hi, this is Maya. She's just got back from her friend's house. Do you mind if I finish off this conversation? Sure. Thank you. I'll have a chat. Oh, beautifully co-produced exit there. Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> um, one. I want to. I think this is a, a too big a question to answer. Too complex, really, for now, possibly. But how do we? How do we influence um, the funding? And, uh, and um, it, have I got any control with that? I'm thinking possibly in some level, but who, who has more control? Uh, so I, I feel like I need to explore that a little bit more. Um, and two, as I was thinking that, um, I'm, I'm toying with a bit of an issue around um, listening to um, service users, people with lived experiences in my current role at the moment. And, um, and I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe I have got a bit of power in this situation because I'm actually put into the team, well, how are we gonna listen to our service users? And, you know, people are, uh, you know, suggesting all kinds of different ways. And actually, you know, have they got a, lots of experience around what co-production is? Do they understand the framework? So, but, and, um, and so, Maybe I've got a little bit of power in my own, in my own, you know, power of influence, which is relatively small, but we need sort of bigger changes on a policy sort of level or a funding. But how can, how can people, how can pe likes of me have more influence? And I think that's what I want to know. And I'm not expecting you to answer anyone. <laughs> I don't know. I think there's, there's a couple of interesting things that go feed back into what, what's been said earlier today and also in previous sessions. So as Dan said, money is the thing which drives so much of the agenda. It has an agenda to make more money. So it funds research that is more likely to result in commercially profitable. So drugs is more profitable than therapies um, or you know, um, self-management. So the money gets funneled in that direction because then you can tax it and create more money. The trouble is that the more money doesn't get invested in end funding the therapies, it gets invested in funding more drugs and more drugs and more drugs and goes around in a loop on this side, funding more and more and more of this stuff. Whilst the argument and rhetoric says, if we make more money, we'll be able to support this stuff here that's less profitable. It never happens, it never shifts over, it never flows in that direction. Um, but if, if there is a ways in which it can be shown that the, the participatory co-production ways of working actually save money or have some financial benefit. It's a very mercenary perspective, but actually it's an effective one for the things that have power within the system we're currently working in. It talks their language, it talks to their um, uh, accounts and balances, checks and balances about what is, and, and, it, and I, I firmly believe that there are financially beneficial implications for doing this because you don't get it so wrong you do things that are more effective for people and you improve their health and well-being or you sustain their quality of life for longer so you save money in doing it this way it might take a bit more investment up front but longer term it has this knock-on effect of saving money within the overall system but there isn't the evidence out there to demonstrate that categorically in the same way that you have a randomized controlled trial that shows drug A is better than drug B or whatever it is. Um, but I think that kind of evidence would have a hugely influential 
um, impact on on uh, trying to persuade those in the system to invest more in that stuff because there, there's always investment pots for things that save money. But I think there's there's something or, or for me. I think there's something more interesting around that the, what you were saying and articulating around your personal power. And I think throughout society, not just within health research or health services, there will be something so fantastic about little things that can get everyone to reflect on the power that they have within any given situation. Because I, I think we often, all of us have power that we don't recognize in different situations. It's like doctors or nurses that, you know, have power in that. They don't think that they're, they're, they're good people. They have good intentions. They're there to help people. They don't think about the power they have over those people, but they do. They do have, have power. But if, if there is some way of just getting people to momentarily pause and consider that their own power in any given kind of interaction with others, I think that kind of way of mindfulness would just have such a big impact on potentially, I don't know, on people's relationships and what could get done and how things are done, um, or at least enabling people to be aware of it and use it to better advantage or to actually offer it because you can give power to people it's that, that asking those questions you know what would you want to do how should we do this to those that by all um structures within the services that you work you have power over but if they're they they they're your employees you they, you're their line manager but if you ask them how should we do this that's some trading some power isn't it in some way um i don't, I don't know i think i think that's that's because it's, it's hard to create the systemic changes but actually on an individual basis if you can get enough people to act in this way you create that um that the same effect over it might take longer if you're going to involve people what sometimes it's it's like your um the all is required of me is my lived experience and that you know so what else do i need do i need investment in me as an individual you know i sit and i've sat in grant funding subcommittees and when i do that i channel my inner itu nurse that is in my bed space and that's my ventilator and i'm saying to consultants don't touch my ventilator you know and, and, and i'm used to kind of standing up to people and, and i'm used to doing that and and a lot a lot of people haven't had that that type of experience so and what, what i have noticed is that a lot of the a lot of the training for sort of patients or in ppi and whatever it's around about research methods and whatever but it, but it's not into you know what, what what do i lynn laidlaw need to be better at what i do Where, where's the investment in in me as, as an individual, where's the investment in my influencing skills? And and that that is it is totally is totally missing. You know, I I've had to reflect and pick up stuff along along the way and you know that kind of put into put into box where boxes where they're you know they're they're happy for and what what do I get involved with? and who decides what I get involved with? And is it just the plain English summary or actually, you know, are, are, you, going to, are you going to include me in what your primary outcome should be or, or in services, are you going to include me in the training that, that, that professionals should get or, or whatever? Or am I, just, am I just there because I've got lived experience and actually that, that's the only thing that, that I need? Um, there's, a, there's a load of stuff in there as well. So, only lived experience I think is an interesting thing in its own right. I, I do sometimes, I sometimes reflect that the limited experience I've had to what people who uh, are asked to be patient public involvement reps is on kind of the, in the research world is they get kind of taught about how to run a res, uh, randomized controlled trial and what these various bits mean and I always I kind of think yes it's important to understand the context 
but it, it, there's something about why people are in the room. And I guess this is about transparency. I'm not judging any of this, but I, I sometimes think it's not clear why people are there. I, I mean, do you, uh, do you have a sense, Lynn, when you walk into a new project that people understand your role? I, or do so you define I, your role because you're so, uh, so used to what you have to do to, to service a project? Is this about you or is it about them? I don't... So I think that I would don't have the opportunity to find my role. I think that my role is always defined for me and I spend a lot of my time fighting against the confines of the box that I have been put into. So what's your usual box? So I, I think um, a lot of it is, so I will, I will be sent things like, oh, here's the plain English summary for you to have a look at. Well, how can I judge how good this plain English summary is or, or, or how relevant in whatever it is, unless I've seen the whole grant? Yeah. So, th yeah, so, so, so things, things, th things like that. Yeah, so, it, and it's... <laughs> there is an inherent... Uh... A kind of conflict between that. If there is a summary of something, how good, a, how how is what any one person able to judge how good a summary that is of the thing if they don't know what the thing is? <laughs> yeah, but but um, you know that that is an it's an absolute and total classic. And what what I have learned to do, what bitter experience has taught me to do, and I'm not very good at it. I'm I'm just trying to do this. Is when I get invited to a new thing now, is to work out the terms in advance and and actually me and, and a friend were had had a particular experience and we were we were talking about this and and I don't think that I would like to go down this route do we need a contract because actually when things when things go wrong if I so if I I'm doing insight for something or in, or involvement for something whether it be research whether it be services or whatever if there's some things that I am fundamentally unhappy with, if there's some ethical considerations, sometimes in the widest sense of the word or whatever, what do I do with that? Where do I go with that? The only power I have is the power to walk away. And that, you know, and I will walk away and they will get someone else in to fill, to fill that space. And a lot of it is, sometimes when I'm doing training with PPI groups, what is very apparent to me is that is that people haven't had training in patient public involvement, co-production, whatever what it is. And often you need to give people permission to be critical, to be that, that essential critical friend function. But if people don't know that's what's expected of them, and especially if you're involved with, with clinicians, you know, if someone is your consultant and they involve you in something, then what, what, what does that relationship look like? How, you know, are, are you holding back or don't, don't feel that you can say what, what you really think because they're your consultant? Mm. Yeah. For me as well, I think this links into something around value and respect in terms of paying for, you know, lived experience and involvement. And then that becomes a role in itself. And, um, you know, because I over you know, over the few different experiences that I've had, you know, I can name a good few people that have come, you know, around their lived experience, but what, why they've been so good is that not only do they bring their own lived experience, but they actually talk about, um, you know, things objectively and see things from other people's point of view. And actually they've got this broad awareness um, of the, you know, how, how this condition or whatever affects, um, lots of people and and they bring that as well so they they're bringing their lived experience but they're also bringing a whole bunch of skills in terms of communicating with people in terms of sharing their st story and others in terms of how they're you know how they can uh, build relationships um, um, and whatever but um it's that's by chance often or you know it's because you've met somebody with lived experience that has them them other brilliant skills as well but then are we paying people are we value 
valuing people enough for that? You know, are we, do we have to, because um, I think, I think that, I think roles have been created for people. I know we have peer, peer workers um, employed in, in health. But I don't think we understand a lot about what that, what is a peer worker and what does that mean? And actually, um, how do we value their skills? Because I think they're potentially paid at, you know, a band five or something like that. And is uh, how do we box that? You know what I mean? How do we how do we value that experience? Because, you know, we're not just asking somebody because of their condition, are we? And I think when we do, that can be potentially awkward for for a, a lot of people. I mean, I've certainly been in situations where people have been asked to be there because they've got schizophrenia and actually they really can't engage even with reasonable adjustments in terms of um, helping to shape a service and it's really difficult for them and really difficult for other people and so yeah so I think it's a whole area. Yeah we come into your world you know I mean we don't have meetings at my house you know, I need, I need to come into hospital or I need to go up to the university and I need to do it in my time and I, and, and I, need, to, and, and I need to travel and, and, and whatever. And, and you're right, we, we don't, and I think remuneration, oh, we could have it, you could have a whole podcast about, about remuneration. Um, and it, yeah, it's just so, and what, what value, and, and, who, and, and who decides when you get remunerated or, 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 or not yeah it it's just and I, I think that, that mental health is, is is different from physical health isn't it because we don't have peer support workers and whatever in the same but some of these lived experience ambassadors and I'm so I need to be careful what what I'm saying here but I'm a bit uncomfortable that we elevate some people and does that so if you elevate some people, you give them a job as a lived experience ambassador, you, you pay them and then that becomes your PPI. And who do they owe their allegiances to? Because they're getting paid by an organisation. And I'm not sure that we've unpicked a lot, a lot of that and what, it, and, what it actually, and what it actually means. There's also um, associated with people in those roles that notion of normalization so they become normalized the context in which they're living and working so dan and myself went to um the mayo clinic innovation center in the states many years ago now it seems we paid did that visit um and they have designers working in a studio in one of the wards or uh, in the hospital working with patients with staff to do little innovation projects continuously they're a team there but what they noticed over the course of i think the first kind of 10 to 12 years was that the designers self-elected to move on after every th roughly three years and in talking to them they th they, they think and it's all very subjective and, and not kind of um, uh, perhaps as rigorous as uh, academic research might be able to go into drill down into and, and find out but they suspected that it was because the designers themselves felt they were becoming too normalized so they were losing some of their creativity and i guess the same thing might be happening with some of these expert patient kind of advisors these patient representatives that are elevated to these roles and funded by the institution that they're working with or for that they become normalized to the academic procedures and processes so they rather than challenging them they become more um, fall into those roles of anticipating what is going to get through and what isn't going to get through and just doing the bits that are going to get through rather than continuously challenging the bits that don't get through. Um, and then you lose the value of why they're there in the, or one of the values of why they're there in the first place. Um, yeah, I sometimes feel that it's like um, patients or service users or whatever are like porridge and like Goldilocks porridge, we've got to be just right. So when some, you know, in some aspects, oh, you know, she, oh, you know, Lynn's far too experienced and whatever. She's not, I, you know, I, I, as I become more knowledgeable, I lose my do like patient, you know, it, it, it experience kind of thing, you know, and then in other roles, like I'm having to do a CV, you know, what? I've never done a CV before in my life, you know, like, you know, to my husband, oh, you need to help me with this, you know, and then, and I'm interviewed by three people and whatever for, for 
a role that I'm never going to get because actually they're looking for people that have worked at director level or whatever in, in, in their personal life, you know, even though it's, a, and it's, and it's always what someone else decides is needed, you know, and what, what control do I have over, over that? And I have to, it's like, I've got these multiple personas and I need to put on the persona that, that, that that's, if I'm interested in the role that's going to get me that, get me that role, I have to figure out what they're looking for. And then, it's like the process of applying for that. a job, except you don't get paid for it. Yeah, yeah. They've created this set of essential and desirable criteria of what they're looking for, you know, and they interview you. And you've got no, you're not going to get paid for it if you get the job, but essentially they're looking for a very specific person. Yeah. yeah. But, but you've got the added bonus of that they all have the same job description. Uh, <laughs> But it's up to the individuals who are recruiting to decide just how, just what those kind of characteristics are and whether li this particular Lynn is the right person for them on that day or, oh no, I think uh, she might know a bit too much about research right. or she might know a bit too much about this condition or a bit too much about hospitals. We'd like somebody who knows a little bit less about hospitals <laughs> in this instance. Yeah, yeah. It, That's it's... insane. That, that really, I mean, the whole point of there being patient and public representation means that they are basically cherry picking people who can do whatever they want. Yeah. Well, yeah. And there's, there's some groups will move you on after a couple of years mm -hmm. because, because you come, because you become too experienced. Honestly, you don't, you don't know the, you don't know the half of it. You know, I've been, I've been bumped out of groups as well for, for being, yeah, too outspoken and, oh, it, it's, it's an, an app, you know, I, I describe it as a game. It's like PPI the game. You know, and you play games by rules, you know, and I'm expected to play the game and I haven't had any input into the rules. I often don't have sight of the rules. Often I'm, they expect me to play the game five minutes before the end or I'm subbed out. I'm the only person that's getting, that's playing, that's not getting paid. I can be too expert at the game. I can be, you know, too novice at the, and, all, the, all these things, you know, all these conditions, all these rules, none of which I have any control over, but I am, but I am subjected to. And people are making judgments about, about me. And then when I apply for roles, I'm applying in competition. I, I'm in competition against other patients, against other service users, against other people with lived experience. And that's really uncomfortable because basically I'm saying, you need to choose Lynn Laidlaw because I'm better. I'm better than those other patients. And what fails to be recognised, going back to where this conversation started, is that all those people applying that are in competition with each other are absolutely emotionally invested Good. Yeah. in trying to make a positive contribution to the wider kind of health system and for society, not just for their career or for their own track record or whatever it is, but for this wider goal for everyone and that's kind of completely lost in the in the whole process mm -hmm. so really say go on, go on, Dan, sorry no, no. Going. No. i was just gonna say i don't know whether we're we're thinking about kind of see we, we get we get on we get on one don't we and we can't stop talking but if we are thinking about kind of closing soon we've got to think of we've got to finish on something positive because like i want to <laughs> <laughs> I need to leave this conversation feeling good. I don't know about you lot. I mean, you know, that's not to say, um, I, uh, you know, I agree with everything that's just been said. And, um, and there's a lot to do in terms of improving this kind of world. And I think that's what we're all here for anyway, isn't it? And um, it's, I don't, I, so I think, I think the situation that's been described so eloquently by Lynn and the, is that, all parties are stumbling around in the dark here and we are asking for transparency where there isn't it, it isn't really in anybody's gift to give there aren't there aren't clearly articulated roles there aren't clearly articulate expectations and um, there's i, I kind of hope this was going to sound positive but it's, it's gone off <laughs> um, <laughs> But, it's, I like, I'm liking it so far. Yeah, I'm so I'm, I'm saying that maybe it's it's a drive towards transparency, and and again, it might come down to our individual ability to be as 
honest and transparent in our relationships around involvement as we can be at every stage. So I think sometimes, perhaps for your group, Liz, that you're starting to think about convening, it's about sort of saying, everything that you suggest won't, won't happen. Um, but um, what we hope is by your voice being present, that might spark new conversations that would have never happened if you were here. And those new conversations might not be implementable or might not be doable, but they start people thinking differently. I mean, it, it is, it's, we, we've talked about expectation settings, we've talked about intentions before in these. And, and I think the intention, I think largely on an individual basis is, is positive. We want to make things better for people. But I think that transparency is, is that next stage. What should people expect? How should people be treated? And we should know that before people get involved, because that's, that's how people should make a decision. There should be informed consent about how people are coming into these sorts of things and knowing what they're likely mm -hmm. to receive. Yeah, I mean, I can, you know, so I can end in a hugely positive note. Yes. So I, I got unwell and I, you know, I lost my job, I lost my driving license and life as I know it changed. And I can't remember, you know, what you live becomes your reality. But my reality and my life has, I, and this is part of the emotional thing, I owe involvement so much. It has given me a purpose. It has made me feel that I wasn't put on the, on the, um, you know, that, 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 I still had some, that I still had something to give, that, that, that I had, that has skills and knowledges and experience that, that, that were helpful. It has given me skills that I didn't have before. I've been all over the UK. I have been abroad. It has brought me into contact with people that I never would have met that have become really good friends, researchers that are just blow my mind with how fantastic they are, other public contributors that are, that are wonderful and it is just, it has given me so much, but I can't, but I need to, but I, I don't think I'm, I'm doing anything by being Pollyanna about it. I, I think that alongside what it's, what it's given me, and, and I'm, I'm still hanging in there, and I'm hanging in there because the positives outweigh the negative. And I talk in my blog about there is no high like the involvement high, you know, before lockdown, I was like traveling a lot and I used to maybe get up at four o'clock in the morning and I'd be away down to London and I'd get back at 11 o'clock at night and I'd just be like gibbering with excitement about something that, that I'd done or a, a really good experience. And that was, that was absolutely fantastic. Or when people email me to say, you know, when we, you know, I had an experience this week where it was like a last minute application and I read it and, you know, I made some quite hard hitting points and whatever, and it was redone and they were, there they were. And that was, it was just fabulous because I, I know that, you know, hopefully we'll get funded, but it, it, it changed, well, in my perception, it changed the research for the better. And that's, that's just, you know, and, and I didn't, I didn't have a lot of that in my working life, <laughs> you know, the, the degree of the degree of satisfaction so it's it's definitely and it's because i'm so emotionally invested and because it means so much that's why i want it to be better and that's why i critique the system as well because because i think that that that's that that's really that's really important but i do it from a place of wanting it to be better and this wanting to work because it's so important that is a positive note to finish on thank it you is. lynn yeah.